Welcome to Gateway Church. We're so glad you tuned in today. I wanna encourage you, take a moment and invite a friend to church. You can do that by simply sharing this video or text them the link and let them know they can join you now. Whether it's your first time tuning in or you're a regular member here at Gateway, we are honored to take this moment together as the church to worship. And so I hope you'll prepare your hearts, lean in right now as we worship together. been 
so easy to forget that the Bible says that God is as close as his name on our lips. That the house of God is not in a building. I think now more than ever we understand that and we're beginning to understand that as a church, as the body of Christ, that you are the temple of the living God. He doesn't dwell inside of buildings. He dwells inside of his people. So right now where you are at home, with your family, in your living room, wherever you are. I just want you to stand together with us. We're going to sing this again. We're going to sing a song, a beautiful song that says, I'll build my life. I'll put my trust. I'll put my faith and my hope in Jesus. You know, everything can be shaken, but there is one, there is one kingdom and there is one person that cannot be shaken. That is King Jesus. And the kingdom of God cannot be shaken. Though everything else is being shaken around us, His kingdom inside us cannot be moved. His promise, His goodness, it never changes. So right now, let's lift our hands to Jesus right where we are. Let's lift our hearts to Him as a sign of surrender. God, we give you our family. We give you our marriage. We give you our children. We give you our job, God, our finances, our future. We surrender it right now to you, King Jesus. And holy, there is no one like there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you.
You know, right now in this moment, we want to invite you if you're watching. What an amazing time. How, how many of you are thankful for God's presence? I'm so thankful that He's here with us right now. Church is looking a lot different these days. You know, we're in our home or maybe you're at parked, hopefully in your car watching. Uh, wherever you are, if you're in your car. Uh, but wherever we are, you know, we're, we're having to get used to this new life and this new rhythm of church. But right now, something exciting that we like to do is normally we do a regular meet and greet, but we want to do a virtual meet and greet. So if you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on social media, right now in the comment section for the next 45 seconds, we just want you to engage. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know who's watching with you and what God's doing in your life right now as we continue to worship and play. For the next 30 seconds, go for it. See ya. Gateway family, let's continue to engage in the comments throughout the service. And this is another great time that you can invite a friend to church. You can do that by simply sharing this video to your social media or send them a text and let them know about it so they don't miss this incredible message that's coming up. You know, as a church, it's really important to us that you know that we're here for you in this season. And so if you have any needs, whether they're spiritual or physical, we would love to know about that. You can email us at care at gatewayhome.com and we'll be really responsive and, and get back to you. We really wanna come alongside of you during this season. Yeah, and maybe you have a prayer request and you just have something simple that you can comment right now and our team will jump on and pray with you, send you a comment back, or maybe you think it's a little bit more than that. You can simply email us at prayer at gatewayhome.com and our team will be joining you and praying for whatever God has in your life. Yeah, one of the things we've done in this season is launched virtual yeah. groups. And so they're going really well. There's still opportunity to jump in, uh, whether you're a student or uh, singles or whatever the case may be, we have a group for you online. Yeah, and so you can find out more about that at gatewaygroups.com. Yeah, and right after this, we're gonna have an amazing kids service where your kids are gonna have fun. They're gonna learn about God. I promise the whole family's gonna enjoy it. So right after this, gather the kids around and enjoy the service. If you wanna give, you can do so today at give.gatewayhome.com. We're coming into uh, an amazing message yeah. from Pastor Ethan, and we're excited about that. We will be right here directly following yeah. the service, but enjoy the message. Hello, Gateway Church. Welcome to Gateway Church Online. It looks a little bit different, but we can still have fun. We can still uh, learn about God together. And I know many of you are watching. You're watching either by Facebook, YouTube, or even you're checking this out later. Go ahead and comment. I know we just did a virtual meet and greet, but even while I'm speaking, my hope is that you hear something that kind of res that resonates with you. you, know, you can go ahead and give a thumbs up, fire emoji, whatever you want to use, but we're still interacting even though I can't see you. I know you can see me, but as the word goes forth, my hope is that you're leaning in uh, and you're wanting to hear something from God because I believe I have a message today for all of us, no matter where we are in life, but we're in this situation together that we're walking through, and I believe that what I'm talking about today uh, will give us fuel, will give us strength to be able to continue walking through. I'm actually going to be out of the book of James today, so if you have your Bible, you can go there, or you can go to version, whatever it may be. And we'll be going through for at least the next couple of weeks through the book of James and really talking about what is essential for the life of a believer. James was written about 50 AD, and it was during a time of intense trials, intense persecutions for the believers at that time. Now, the writer of James is very important. It's not, he wasn't one of the disciples. He wasn't one of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. This guy is actually James the Just. And James the Just was the pastor over the church in Jerusalem. So he's writing to the church that is now being persecuted and being scattered abroad. And this is how it starts out. 
in James 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. So here's who James the just is. James is actually the brother of Jesus. And I want you to think about that for a second. What would it take for you to believe that your brother was the son of God? It would take a lot because I have a brother and he's great, but I know he wouldn't be God. He didn't walk around prideful though. He didn't walk around with a shirt that said, Jesus is my brother or a tunic, whatever he may have worn at that time. He didn't walk around saying, look at me. This is who I am. This is my brother. Because the reality is, if you look through the Gospels, he actually did not believe in Jesus. So it wasn't his miracles. It wasn't his teachings. It wasn't the things that Jesus did. It was the fact that he saw his brother die and that his brother was resurrected, that he says, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he actually ends up being martyred in giving his life. And this is who is writing these verses that we're about to go through today. And I feel like it's important to have that context because he would have walked with Jesus and know, known him during that time. And now after Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, James is writing to the church. So the point or the title of my message today is The Point of Trials. The Point of Trials. I know we're all in this time with COVID-19 that's going around the world. We're all in the middle of a trial together. And I'm sure you're probably wondering to yourself, what is the point of all this? We're going through this. We're trying to figure it out. What's next? We're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, so to say. But we're still having those questions, and we're still trying to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to be doing during this time? How am I growing during this time? How am I helping my family grow, neighbors, etc.? And how am I being a light and seeing other people's lives changed? So everyone sees trials a little bit differently. Um, and for some, going to the doctor is a trial. I don't know if you've ever gone out in public and had one of your kids embarrass you just a little bit. I have four kids. I have two girls. They're six and five. Then we have two boys. They're three and two. And they're fun. They're incredible. They're amazing. But there are times, especially when we go to the doctor, that it seems like a trial. My oldest daughter, Addie, um, she used to be traumatized by going to the doctor. She would just cry. She would throw a fit. She wouldn't want the doctor to touch her at all. Uh, and even when we would go for her brother or her sister, she would just cry. And I guess she was just feeling the pain that they were going to go through. I don't know what it was, but it was just a huge trial in her life. Now, I know many of us, whenever we go through a trial, it's a lot more serious, but every single one of us have a certain perspective when it comes to trials. And James does his best to give us God's perspective whenever we're going through a trial. So in verse 2 of James 1, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking nothing. So it says, my brethren, count it all joy. Here's what's interesting about this. One, we know that we're all going to go through trials. He says it's actually inevitable. Count it all joy when. So we are going to go through trials. But the thing that we need to realize first and foremost is that the trial that we go through is not an indication of how God feels about you. The trial that we're going through isn't an indication of how God feels about you. So many times we could feel like it's punishment. We could feel like, okay, we're not measuring up. Hey, I need to grow during this time. And that, while that may be true, God doesn't send the trial so that you'll fail. He doesn't send the trial or a trial doesn't come into your life so that you won't measure up. God only gives us a test so that we can pass it. That's why he gives it to us. And it says, count it all joy. This word count means evaluate, to evaluate your life, to evaluate the things that you're coming up against during this time. Count it all joy. And I want you to think about this for a second. Our values will determine our evaluations, especially when we're in the middle of a trial. If you value comfort, when a trial comes, you will resent character. If you value convenience, 
whenever a trial comes, you'll actually go against convictions that you may have in your life. So the values that we have will determine our evaluations of the circumstances that we may be in. So it says, count it all joy when you fall in to various trials. How can we have joy whenever things are going bad all around us? Because that's what a trial is. It's an outward circumstance, conflict, troubles that come against our lives. So how can we have joy in that? First of all, we need to understand that God would never give us a command if we weren't able to actually walk it out. So here's what he's saying. That while happiness may be about your external circumstances, the joy that you have is rooted in who the Holy Spirit is. And through his spirit, we can have joy on the inside, no matter what may be going on around us. Because it's easy to have joy when the trial is over. But he's saying, not because of, but in spite of the trial that you're going through, that you and I can have joy in the middle of that and walk through it with an attitude, knowing that we're going to come out on the other side. So what's happening in the midst of a trial? See, we're going through a test, but I want to tell you something, and this may shock you for a second, but faith is actually not produced in trials. That's not what's happening in a trial. Your faith is being tested in a trial, but it's produced by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17 tells us that. That's how our faith grows, but our faith is being tested in the middle of a trial to see if it's genuine, to see if it's true, it's really to tell us where we are in our lives when it comes to our relationship with God. Because it's easy to walk with God whenever things are going well and you're feeling blessed, things are going great in your life. But when you're in the middle of a trial and things get hard, things get a little bit more difficult than you thought it was going to be, there may be trouble in your family, with friends, whatever it is, that's when we need to understand that our faith is being tested. So what is being produced in a trial? Here's what's being produced as well, patience. See, we've all heard desperate times call for desperate measures. But what we never say to ourselves is desperate times call for immense patience. Let patience have its perfect work so that in the end we'll be complete, lacking nothing. So it's important for us to have patience. This word patience, it comes from the Greek word which means to remain under. To remain under this is the quality that helps you finish a marathon. I've never run a marathon before. If you have, congratulations. That's awesome. But I've never done that before. But I, here's, when I've talked to people, here's what they've tell, told me. That there's almost like this wall when you hit a certain mile that you have to break through. There's, you have to have endurance during that time. That's really when the run starts. When you hit that wall and you have to overcome it. But you have to remain under that pressure to continue walking. And that's what this means. While we may be wanting to get out and for things to get easier, God may be saying, even in the middle of that time, I'm actually trying to make you stronger because the trial that you're going through today may simply be preparation for what God has, you, has for you in the future. And he needs you to be stronger and he needs you to be better, not just to make it easier for you to get out of that trial. So here's another thing about patience. Patience is also a mark of maturity. My kids at times struggle with patience. I'm, and I'm sure if you have kids, if you've ever gone on a road trip, or maybe you're this person, I struggle with it, patience as well. When you go on a road trip, what's the thing that they say 15 minutes of you leaving the house? Are we there yet? And I'm like, no, we're not there yet. We have Five hours to go before we get to Dallas, because this literally happened on a road trip, and I just laughed to myself. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. We have a, a, a way to go. But a person who is mature is willing to walk out the process, because patience is a mark of maturity in our lives. Let me say it this way. Patience is actually the bridge between the trial and the breakthrough. It's the thing that takes us from the thing that we're going through to where the breakthrough that God has for us, to we're able to walk on the other side with strength and with power. So trials also bring along with it answer questions that we need answers to. I'm sure many of you are asking a lot of questions right now. Hey, when is this going to be over? Hey, I've been in this trial long enough. What's, what's going to happen on the other side of it? 
But where you go to look for answers will determine the outcome. Let me say it another way. Your outlook will determine your outcome. So if we don't look to God for the answer, we're going to get an outcome that we may not want. But we have the ability to come to God to hear what he has to say and give us his perspective on the circumstance. Because we're, whenever we're in the middle of a trial or we're in the middle of pain, we don't necessarily always see as clearly as we ought to. James 1.5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Most people would say the thing that you need in a trial is strength to make it through. But I want to say this. What good is having strength if you don't know how to apply it? Wisdom is actually the ability to apply strength appropriately so that you're able to make it to the other side. So we need to come to God for wisdom. Where do you go whenever you have a big decision in your life? Where do you go whenever you're walking through a trial? I I, I was studying this. And I looked on Google for this thought, where do people go whenever they have to make life-changing decisions? And I know I went to Google, but here's, here's actually an interesting fact, that 85% of people, when they had to make a life-changing decision, went to Google to find out what the experts had to say, to find out what other people's thoughts are. And yes, people, you need to submit thoughts to people. You need to have good counselors. There's safety there. But did you take the time to go to God first Ask his, and ask him for wisdom because he wants to give it to you. But God's wisdom will ultimately produce God's results. Man's wisdom will produce man's results. And at the end of the day, if you want God's hand on your decision, then we need to go to him and ask him for wisdom. And it says he's generous with it. He wants to give it to you. He wants you to know what the next step is and what you're supposed to do in investing even during the trials. Because even during this time, I want to make sure that we're not wasting the trial. Because many of us, we're at home. But are we maximizing our time there? Are we getting closer with our spouse and improving our marriage and growing there? Have we connected with our kids? Have we done something that we've left off for quite some time that we know that we've needed to do? We can invest even during the trials and be persistent in what God has called for us to do. So it's important for us to realize that during this time, God wants to give us wisdom. Now, I sometimes in my life struggle with asking people for help or asking people for wisdom. Um, For those that know me, they know that I am probably the least handy person that you have ever met in your entire life. I wish it weren't true, but it's true. I just can't fix anything. Whenever I try to fix something that's broken, it ends up falling apart. My wife, whenever she tells me something's broken, she automatically on the other side of it says, hey, I know someone we could call, call over a friend, they'll come and help him. Like, Girl, I got this. And those are typically the last words that I say before something is broken. So I want to tell you a little bit about my handiwork, and I'm going to show you how skilled I am when it comes to building things. And we have a picture right here that I wanted to show you. This is a dresser of my daughters. This whole thing is supposed to be white, but this is from Ikea. And a lot of you who have ever built something from Ikea understand what I'm saying to you right now, that the instructions weren't there. It could have been user error, but I'm gonna blame Ikea for doing it. But I asked my wife after I got finished with it, I was like, hey, so do you mind if I paint that white afterwards? And she was like, no, we're not gonna paint it. So we've actually tucked it in the back to where no one could see that they were to walk in to our daughter's bedroom. But this is what it looks like for me to go and actually put something together, which is why I now just have other people help me out. But I want to say something. This is what our life looks like whenever we try to use our own wisdom or simply man's wisdom and don't come to God for his wisdom. Our life ends up looking incomplete or things end up being out of place and things in our life don't look the way that God desired them to because we didn't come to him and ask him for wisdom. James 1 continues on in verse 6, and it says, But let that person who needs wisdom ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, 
driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So it matters how we come and ask. Do we come to God in doubt? Do we come to God in fear? Do we come to God not realizing that, hey, he has the desire to help you and wants to give you wisdom? Because it says here, if we're, we're asking God in doubt, that we are like a, the waves that are coming in. We're up and we're down, we're hopeful, and then we're in despair the next moment. But divide, the doubt means divided in one's mind. You doubt God's allegiance to you. You doubt your allegiance to God. There's a doubt that's happening. And we talked about this word double-minded. It means two-souled. You're, you're stuck in between faith and you're stuck between faith and unbelief and you're trying to figure this out. But we're double-minded and that leads to instability in our lives. And in the middle of a trial, it's important that we come to God because he's the one who ultimately provides the stability. He provides the foundation that we need in order to be able to move forward and strength, and in power. In the Old Testament, there's a guy who I believe went through a major trial that I feel like we can learn from. His name is Elijah. I'm going to give you a paraphrased version. It's coming out of the ESV. For those that don't know, that's the Ethan Standard Version. Yes, I have my own version. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about the story of Elijah, and it's going to be real quick, but he is one of the most well-known prophets in the Old Testament. He's one of the men in the Old Testament. If you read his story in 1 Kings, it starts there and continues on. He actually didn't die. God actually took him straight up to heaven without dying. So he's a very powerful prophet. But he actually went through a trial, even though he was faithful in what God, God called him to do. And it's interesting because in his life, there is a sequence that happens that we don't many times think about. And it's this, that he actually started out in a victory and then went through the trial. We think first we're going to have the trial and then go on to victory. He had an incredible victory. And if you read the story, he simply shows up to King Ahab and says, it's not going to rain until I say so. Elijah was a little bit gangster, if you know what I mean. If you're showing up to the king with that level of boldness and saying, it's not going to rain until I say so, you're trusting and you're confident that God is going to show up and that God is going to move because of what he told you. So it doesn't end up raining. And it was a big deal for an agricultural society. But at that time, Israel was actually following after Baal. And God was clearly saying to them that Baal is not going to provide you the rain. He, Baal is not going to provide you anything during this trial. You're ultimately going to have to come to me. And then finally, there's a showdown on the mountaintop about who is the true God, whether it was Baal or whether it was God. And the test was going to be, what God could call down, would uh, burn the sacrifice with fire whenever they tried and they prayed. So first the prophets of Baal went and they went all day long and nothing ever happened. And then Elijah set up his altar and prayed to God and God sent down fire to burn up the sacrifice. And then he went and removed all the prophets of Baal. So God shows up in a mighty way. And in the very next chapter, you see Elijah being threatened by Queen Jezebel, and then he runs for his life. The man who had just seen an incredible victory, the man who had said that it wouldn't rain till I said it would, and then three years later, it rained when God said it was time, ends up running in fear and leaving the place that God had called for him to go. And here's why, because there's always a process. Because he thought that whenever he had this victory, everyone was going to turn to God and everyone in that nation was going to begin following him. But that's the opposite of what may have happened at this time. That's not what happened. And so in his disappointment and in his discouragement, he leaves and goes and runs away into the wilderness. And during this time, he actually left one of his servants in the town where he was at, and then continued on alone. So he's all by himself at this time. And I want to say this because I feel like it's an important point for us to realize is that in the middle of a trial is the worst time to be isolated. It's important for us to have community. It's important for us to have fellowship. 
It's important for us to have relationships we're in, when we're in the middle of a trial. This is why we have groups now. It wasn't just a good idea. We believe it was a God idea, but the, we're in a trial right now. And we wanted to be able to have a place where people could go to have relationship with other people because we know there are things going on in your life that you need other people to walk with you in. You need to be able to share your story, the things that are going on in your life, the burdens that you may have. And we believe that we is better than me. And it's important for us to continue to walk out in relationship together because we believe that's where life change is. But in this moment, when he's isolated, God shows up to him. And I believe one of the points of clarity that God pointed out to him is that while you may have been about a moment and thinking that moment was going to be victory for you and for the children of Israel, I'm all about a movement. And I'm starting something here and it's begun with you, but I want to let you know that you are not alone in this, even though you may feel like you are. That God wants to have movement in our lives, not for us to get complacent, but he wants us to continue to walk along with everything that he has for every single one of us. And God, as he's interacting with Elijah as he's at Mount Sinai, says to him a question that I actually feel like can be applicable to us today. Because I actually don't believe it was a question about location and proximity. It was a question about where Elijah was in his heart. And this is what God asked him. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you isolated? Why have you chosen to be alone? Why have you chosen to doubt? Why have you chosen to be in fear, to be discouraged during this time? And Elijah just says, a thing that many people feel, but even though they may not say. He said, it's enough for me, I'm done, I'm out, and he wanted to give up and he wanted to quit. But during this time, Elijah let God minister to him. Because even in the middle of a trial, I want you to know that God is still with you, he's still for you, and that he promised that he would never leave you, he promised that he would never forsake you. And it's important for us to walk forward with this truth knowing that God is with us. So there's a moment in the story where God shows up to Elijah in a very powerful way. At first, if you read through the passage, it says that there was a great wind that comes, and a powerful wind, it's knocking down rocks, but it says that God wasn't in that. It said there was another powerful display, and the earth began to shake, and there was an earthquake, but God wasn't in that either. And then in the same way that Elijah had seen fire come down, there was a fire that came across. But God wasn't in that either. Just so you know, that's where they got the band name, Earth, Wind, and Fire. I have no clue if that's true or not. Okay, back to my point. But then in the story, there's another part that I feel like is so powerful and so strong, and my hope is that you catch this. While God may not have been in the powerful displays that we may think of God to be in, he was in the gentle whisper. Here's what you need to understand about a whisper, is that you have to be close to hear it, and you have to drown out the other noise to be able to understand what is being said. And in that moment, Elijah realized that God was there. He covers himself up. But Whenever we're in a trial, we need to understand that breakthrough is on the other side, but it's not sometimes going to come in the powerful display that we may think it is. Many times it's actually in the call to intimacy with God, in that whisper that he wants to give you. But in order to hear that, you're going to have to quiet the other noise that may be around you and hold on to God, who is the one who ultimately gives us joy. So, even in Jesus' life, we have a God who understands. And I want to read Hebrews 12, 2 as I close today. And it says this, looking unto Jesus. Remember, our outlook determines our outcome. We need to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So what he started, he's for sure going to bring to completion. He always finishes what he starts. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. 
It was for the joy that he was set, that was set before him, that Jesus endured the cross. Those same words, patience, endurance, what you need. He understood that there was joy on the other side of the pain that he was going through. He understood that the trial wouldn't last very long and that God had something. So while the he may have been in this time of trial and he felt like everything was breaking down, he realized that eventually there's joy and he endured and ultimately got the breakthrough. And because of that, we have a God that we know feels what we feel. That even in the middle of a trial, you can still have joy because we know that God is with us and we know that he is working everything together for our good. Let me pray for us real quick. Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us your spirit. And because of that, we can have joy. We thank you that even in the middle of a trial that you do not leave us, you promise us that in those moments, it is a call to intimacy for our relationship with you, that you would produce patience in our hearts, the fruit of the spirit, that we would carry your joy that we would carry your peace, that we would carry your strength, but ultimately we would be at a place where we understand that there is a God who cares, that there's a God who loves us, and there's a God who promised that we will reach the other side. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that an incredible message? I wanna take a moment and let you know that if you need prayer for anything at all, we would love to pray for you. You can comment, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, just simply drop a comment. You can send us a direct message or the best way is to email us at prayer at gatewayhome.com and we'll join you during this season and praying for you. I can't think of a better message to just really receive yeah. into our hearts than that word from Pastor Ethan. I think yeah. there were so many things in there for me that really stuck out. I for think, sure. Uh, when you're talking about seasons and 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 trials, uh, the 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 reality that we need patience during this right. time is I'm not always uh, yeah. I'm not always the most <laughs> patient person, and so uh, I think. Yeah, he, he said something that, that patience is the bridge between our trial and yeah. our breakthrough. Yeah. And I think for me, sometimes I get stuck on that bridge. Right. You know, that it's not it's always true. easy to to say, you know, I'm the kid in the car going, Lord, are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know? <laughs> for sure. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's one of those things where you always assume that your faith is what's going to be produced in a trial. And yeah. he was like, that's not, it's your patience. Yeah. And so it's a great reminder of how we can develop something during this season where we're all in a trial. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that I loved is he talked about how during trials, it's actually the worst time to be in isolation. It's true. And I think it's so great that we just launched virtual groups. Pastor Ethan talked about it yeah. in a way that it wasn't a good idea for us. It wasn't just something that we thought might help as a church or what everyone was doing. It was what we believed God was speaking because right now we know that the worst thing for you is to be isolated. So we wanted to offer you an opportunity to come in and be in community so that during this trial, you find friends and family to walk alongside you and encourage you in that patience journey and yeah. on that long bridge that sometimes feels yeah. like the never ending bridge of patience. Yeah. But, yeah. You know. And even if you're, yeah, it doesn't matter where you live. Yeah. You can join. The great thing about virtual groups is you can join them from no matter where you are. And so, uh, again, you can find out more information about that at gatewaygroups.com and find a group that might fit uh, your schedule and your needs. Yeah. You know, COVID-19 has hit all of us in a different way. And we want you to know that we care. Whether you've lost a job, whether you have someone near you that's sick, or you're just now homeschooling for the first time, or things feel chaotic and you need help, we would love to come alongside you and assist you in any way that we can. And if you'll email us at care at gatewayhome.com, our team will be quick to respond and come alongside you in the way that we can to help you during this season. Yeah. If you want to give today, you can do so at give dot gatewayhome.com. Elaine, we've got another service yeah. still today coming up in yeah. our kids' service. What could we expect? It's going to be an incredible time. Your kids are going to fall more in love with God as they're developed to hopefully grow a relationship with Him and get to know Him better. It'll be so much fun though. I promise you'll all get up dancing and yeah. having fun. Mr. Cool. Tyler's so funny. You'll all be laughing. So it's an for incredible sure. service for the entire family. So go ahead right now and call the kids in because right after this service, that service will air 
and it'll be a ton of fun for the entire family. Yeah, we just want to thank you so much for taking a few moments wherever you are yeah. to, to come alongside and watch this service. We hope it's a blessing to you. Go ahead and uh, continue to follow us on social media to stay engaged with what's happening here at Gateway. But we miss you, we love you, and we hope to see you soon. We love you. We can't wait to see you soon. I know that God has something very, very special for this season. So have a great week and we'll see you next week.